John 23rd, I still have three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And pronounce your last name for me. Mollyette. 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 I think I'll still have a sister. So she's going to talk, <laughs> talk to us today about Mary. And then in context of Mary, women's roles in the church today. So with that, I'm going to let her introduce herself. Right. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, let me give you a little background on myself so that you sort of like know who I am and where my where my orientation is. I think that's important. Um, so you know my name, Sister Anne Mary Maliette. You can call me Sister Anne to keep it short. Uh, grew up in Fremont. Grew up on a farm. Uh, my parents, both my parents, God bless them, they're still down on the farm and they're 90. Oh, wow. And they're making it work and my dad ran the company. So he's, he's dead tired, but he can still run that company. Okay, so, so that uh, work ethic and determination is, uh, I think it's in the bloodstream. Um, uh, from there, I uh, graduated from St. Joe's in Fremont. Then I went to Walsh University. Uh, down in uh, North Canton, and uh, uh, completed four years there, and then uh, about the senior year, my senior year, I got this haunting from God. It had been along the way. I think this is important in the scope of our conversation today. You know, so how do we know God is speaking to us? So, during my years in college, um, I had the Sisters of Notre Dame, and I'm the Sister of Notre Dame, at St. Joe's Freeman. So I was familiar with the sisters. And one of the other sisters would come up to me and she said, hey, are you considering a vocation to religious life? And I was like, no. <laughs> 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 oh. oh, no. But in the back of my mind, so, so to run away from the nuns, I went to four years of college then to get away from them. Well, wouldn't you know there were sisters of Notre Dame in North Canton? <laughs> Do you know that? They were at St. Michael's Parish. Okay, so I scared from that parish as well. Um, I was dating a young man. He was three years older than I. I got introduced to him at a wedding when I was a sophomore in college. Nice guy, a farmer, and I said, you know what, I get married, I live on the farm, lots of kids, you know, just farm, you know, that, that's all I knew, right? Grow up on the farm, big family, okay. So, really, really liked him, he liked me, dated for two years. It gets to come around up this time of the year, my senior year, and all of a sudden it dawns on me, because we have been dating for two years, and we have talked about marriage and so on, that he could surprise me with an engagement ring. And my birthday is also in this summer. I totally freaked out on the inside at the realization. And then it was like, no, wait a minute. Any other young woman would be like, you know, excited. I wasn't. I was like, panic, panic. I realized what I had been doing is that this haunting call to religious life, I kept just pushing it away, pushing it away, and going my way. I was going my way. And then I got stopped in my tracks. And I thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, how am I going to get out of this? Oh no, oh no, I, I'm not free to get married because I'm holding a secret from him. Yeah, no, poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm leading him on and I realize this is not going anywhere. I can't. So, and funny thing, ladies, you'd appreciate this. I tried to picture myself in a wedding dress and I couldn't get the picture. Oh no. <laughs> that even freaked me out. I'm like, no, no, no. This is like so long. So, long story short, I have to tell.
tell him this. And I had no idea, you know, what do you do? Blurt it out, which is what I did. I blurted it out and I was running to the ditch. It was in the car. You know, 22, 21, you know, you don't know what's going on. <laughs> so the poor guy, the poor guy, I mean, really, it, it was bad news for him. Bad news for him. So, so I just, so trying to ease the blow, I said, you know, would you give me, just give me some time. I just need to go and check out and that's just like, and rule it out. I'm going to rule it out and then I'll come back and marry you. Okay, so, so okay, so he gives me some time. I get a few phone calls in between, you know, are you sure, are you sure? Yeah, 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 I'm sure. I guess I was trying to discern the call. And I couldn't be in the relationship and try to discern. I needed to like clear myself. So let's fast forward. I graduate from college in May. And um, meanwhile, I'm engaging with the Sisters of Notre Dame up here on Secor Road. And we arranged that I'm, I'm going to enter. What I, so I withheld information from them as well about that I was nearly engaged. Number two, that I was coming to rule it out. So, I go. <laughs> I go, and you know what? Oh, within about a very short period of time, I knew this is exactly where God wanted me. I knew this is exactly where God wanted me. It's clear as day. Clear as day. I was happier there than I was in a relationship with them. Amazing. But how we can wrestle with God. We wrestle with it. But, um, you know, I thank God for the grace today that I, that, I, that, that I did what I needed to do and didn't go to the altar with fingers and toes crossed. That would have been so unfair. So, so unfair. It was already tough to break up at that point. But that would have just been so bad. So, that's my background. So I enter a community of women religious, Notra, Dumb, which means what? Our, our Lady. So I'm a sister of Our Lady, Mary, close to her and close to her son. So, meanwhile, I went into religious life, became a teacher, taught junior high for about 10 years, then went to Central Catholic High School, I was there as a guidance counselor there. Then the community asked me to be in leadership. I was in leadership for 12 years. Um, and then um, after leadership, um, I, I moved to Waterville and started attending Blessed John. And Father Herb saw me, and he knew me because I was a leadership priest. Um, so anyways, he said, um, what are you doing these days? And I said, well, I'm doing retreat work, some spiritual direction. He said, is that enough for you? And I said, no, I need a full-time position. This is just after Mass on the Sunday. So a couple months later, I get this phone call. He says, what are you doing these days? I said, the same, same. And he says, uh, we have a position that's going to open at Blessed John. Well, would you be interested in hearing more about it? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So heard about it, and um, long story short, I was hired. And that was uh, seven years ago, July. Kind of been there with the history of the parish, you know. We're only 13 years old, so I got there. To, so, anyways, that's my background. So I do all the adult faith formation at St. John 23rd. Anything adults need, I'm the go-to person. Okay. So today, in the context of Mary, I'm going to back up a bit, and I want to start out with a story. Because we can't talk about Mary without first talking about Jesus. Okay? Because you know, can't talk about one without the other. So, who is Jesus? Who are you? And, and what is prayer? Because we talk about praying to Mary. Well, first of all, let's, let's back it up. You know, what is prayer? So here's the story. A man's daughter had asked the local pastor to come and pray with her father. When the pastor arrived, he found the man lying in bed with his head propped up 
on two pillows and an empty chair beside the bed. The priest assumed that the old fellow had been informed of his visit. I guess you were expecting me, he said. No. Who are you? Well, I'm the new associate at the local church, the pastor replied. When I saw the empty chair, I figured you knew I was going to show up. Oh yeah, the chair, the bedroom man said. Would you mind closing the door? Puzzled, the pastor went and closed the door. I've never told anyone this, not even my daughter, said the man. But all of my life, I have never known how to pray. At church, I used to hear the pastor talk about prayer, but it always went right over my head. I abandoned any attempt at prayer. Until one day, about four years ago, my best friend said to me, Joe, prayer is just a simple matter of having a conversation with Jesus. Here's what I suggest. Sit down on the chair. Place an empty chair in front of you. And in faith, see Jesus. And just speak to him. And listen to him. So I tried it. And I liked it so much that I do it a couple hours of the day. I'm careful, though. If my daughter saw me talking to an empty chair, <laughs> she would probably have a nervous breakdown or send me to the funny farm. <laughs> story and encourage the old guy to continue the journey. So the pastor prayed with him and returned to the church. Two nights later, the daughter called to tell the pastor that her daddy had died that afternoon. Did he seem to die in peace? asked the pastor. Yes. When I left the house around 2 o'clock, he called me over to his bedside, told me one of his corny jokes, gave me a kiss. And when I got back from the store an hour later, I found him dead. But there was something very strange. In fact, beyond strange. Kind of weird. Apparently, just before Daddy died, he leaned over and rested his head on the chair beside the bed.
more casual, verbalizing it. And then I'll like think it's this is a good opening, you know, if I say yes. something out loud, we're gonna have to just see yeah, longer. Yeah. Somebody's gonna log in and be like, yeah, what's going on? Well, it's a good
a quick development of the relationship. So I want you to go back to when you were a child or if you have children. What do you, what, how, do, how do children relate to Jesus or God? What, what do you do as a parent? What, what are some of the things you do to help them develop a relationship? Um, What's your first name again? Uh, Jessica. Jessica. Mm -hmm. uh, my son uh, went through CCD and had his first communion, um, and he's always been religious. He did a WANA. I don't know if you are familiar with that. It's like a non-denominational uh, youth group every Wednesday, and he did that starting at three, and he loved that. Um, but uh, I think it was through the loss of our dog that I really saw him. You know, start to pray, and he was so concerned about where she was and what was happening and who she was with, and you know that someone was taking care of her. So that really, I think it really bonded his relationship. Okay, all right, yes, the death of a pet, yes, can be a catalyst. How many of you have you yourself or your children? You taught them prayers. Teach them prayers? Mm -hmm. What did you teach them? What kind of prayer? Just a simple bedtime prayer. A bedtime prayer. The Our Father. The Our Father. Anything else? A dinner prayer. Yeah. A dinner prayer, yes, before oh. we eat. Remember that? Honey? <laughs> yes, a dinner prayer. Yes. <laughs> Anyone right. else? We recently taught our oldest son the act of contrition. Oh, the act of contrition. Sure. Is he about second grade? Uh, no, actually, he started a little late, so he is in sixth grade. So he was oh, the sorry. giant sitting among the second grade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, see, that's tough. But he did it. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Look, we pray the rosary every Wednesday night. Okay. All right. We pray the rosary every evening. Okay. That was a practice of my family. Um, and it stands for my parents. Just said. So. When they were engaged, they started praying the rosary together, and they prayed the rosary every day, and they just celebrated 64 years of marriage. Aww. The rosary is their, their devotional prayer together. They pray separately, together, they pray the rosary. And so as kids, we pray the rosary every night. My dad loved. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we begin to learn prayers. We begin to uh, develop a relationship that's somewhere out there or somewhere in here. You know, it's sort of. Then we get to be adolescents. Then what? What'd you do as an adolescent? Did you pray as an adolescent? Did it? What happened? What happened as an adolescent? You threw. Youth group, okay. Through the youth group, you you learn together in a social context because that's what we're at in our adolescence. Any other memory? Church camp. Church camp. Yeah, church camp. Confirmation. Yeah, confirmation. Yeah, maybe confirmation retreat. Being together for confirmation. Yeah, vacation Bible school. Did anybody crack open a Bible when you were an adolescent? Yeah. Yeah, crack open a Bible. We, you became familiar with the stories. You could read. How many of you want to, anybody go to a Catholic school? In here. Okay. Yes, you went to a Catholic school? Primary education. Primary education, where'd you go? St. Louis Health Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, the Tiffin Franciscans had St. Louis. Okay, so we begin then, then we got familiar with the Bible. Okay, got familiar with some stories. Um, maybe you read about the saints, but if you're not Catholic, the saints were not in your purview. Okay, not in your purview. The rosary, not in your purview. Saints, not. 
Mary showed up at Christmas. Mary showed up at Christmas, <laughs> gave birth to Jesus, Mary disappears. Right? She just kind of comes on the scene. <laughs> As an adult, how have you prayed? How do you pray as an adult? On a good day, <laughs> <laughs> I sit in my backyard and there's a pond behind me. And on a good day, that's where I pray. Okay. Well, too many times it's more, uh, well, these are good prayers though too. If I see something, or I hear something on the radio. I heard a very inspiring story on, on the radio the other day. Uh -huh. And it made me pray because it was just so it was so good. It was like, thank yeah. you, God, that there's so goodness in the world and yeah. people aren't all jerks. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Everybody else, how do you pray as an adult? Mantra. A mantra. Who said that? Me. A mantra. What mantra do you use? God actually gives them to me. God it could be a single you. word, it could be three words put together. Sure. I, don't, I don't know why. Did you do it with your reading? Um, no, no, probably not because I'm a busy person. Yes. I just find out that I could just take a word. Okay. And I'll, if I say it one time, I might say it a thousand times. I don't know why. All right. God gives you. Okay. God deals with each one of us personally. No one in this room prays the same. It's a unique relationship. In all the world, how you relate to God or how you relate to Jesus is unique in all the world. Because there's only one of you. And God deals with us personally. Anybody else? What are you going to say? Oh, about 25 or 30 years ago, tells you how old I am. Um, our marriage was in trouble. We started praying in the morning, just two or three minutes together. And now in our old age, that's grown into the liturgy of the hours, and then we keep prayer journeys. Wow. So in the morning we eat, eat breakfast, we eat first, <laughs> and have coffee, and then we have liturgy of the hours, and our, we each have our separate prayer journals. Okay, so you turned a crisis. Yes. Into yes. Uh, an opportunity to pray together. Save your marriage. And save your marriage. I, uh, oh, I believe that, yeah, 100%. Absolutely. Because when God's not part of the marriage, mm -hmm. it gets wobbly. Yeah. It wobbles. Yeah. It's not as deep and not as deep. Anybody else? Anybody? Yes, I have a subscription to the Magnificat, which yes. is a monthly mm -hmm. publication. Right. And it's got all the mass readings, but I tend to just use it for their morning prayer. Right. Because I'm not a morning prayer. So it's, it's nice that we all those words right okay. now. The liturgy of the hours are praying three psalms in the morning, scripture, petitions, and the closing prayer. Same way with the evening prayer. Three psalms, scripture, petitions, and a closing prayer. But in there is a canticle. An evening prayer is the canticle to Mary. Every evening. So all the priests in the diocese pray the liturgy of the hours. All the sisters, including moi, pray the liturgy of the hours. And so every evening we are praying the canticle of Mary. So it's Mary's prayer. I pray Mary's prayer. My soul rejoices. In the Lord. My soul rejoices in the Lord. And so it's, it's, it's Mary's prayer. So that's why I wanted to talk about like prayer because Mary, Mary is very much in the Catholic tradition, it's all scriptural. It's all in the Bible. So we didn't cook up some kind of Marian cult. <laughs> okay, and then made statues. And, and we don't worship Mary. Only God alone is to be worshipped. Mary had a unique role in bringing about salvation. She was a key role. If Mary wasn't there, would the incarnation have happened? Now without a woman, now without a woman, Mary was pivotal, the pivotal. We would be nowhere without a woman. Jesus wouldn't have come. So, you know, listen here, you know, to Mary. Um, uh, listen, listen. 
says, Luke, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee named Nazareth. Okay, this is the betrothal. To a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph in the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So Mary was already betrothed. Now, that word, it would mean that Mary is already in, engaged to Joseph. That's how we would understand it. She's engaged, and the, and the angel says, Rejoice, O highly favored daughter. Daughter of God, rejoice. The Lord is with you. And blessed are you among all of you. So it's like you are highly favored. The angel comes. Now you can imagine, tradition holds that she was probably around 14 years old. And back in the time, that is when the girls got married. Okay? And a lot of times they married an older, an older man married them. Okay? So, it goes on here. Mary is human. She was deeply troubled by his words and wondered what the greeting meant. Can you imagine? An angel saying that you were blessed among women and that you were highly favored. So the angel went on to say to her, okay, she's troubled. She has a human emotion. Do not fear, Mary. You have found favor with God, and you shall conceive and bear a son and give him the name Jesus. Great will be his dignity, and he will be called Son of the Most High. speechless for days. Like, <clears throat> so, God favors a woman, blesses her beyond all blessings to bear the Son of God. So again, in the Catholic tradition, this is the, this is the root of why we honor Mary. Mary sets out, 
So she's going to go to the hill country because the angel tells her, you know what, your your Elizabeth, your older cousin, she's pregnant in, in old age. So she was beyond, beyond the years to conceive a child. Zechariah, her husband, when she told him, scripture has it, when she told him that she was pregnant, the husband laughed and he went mute. He said he became dumb. He couldn't speak. So, according to the scripture, it's like God like silenced him. You, you're not trusting me. And silence. So, Mary takes off to the hill country to go and be with her cousin Elizabeth. Now, maybe it was good that he was silent because those two women had three months to talk. <laughs> experience a miracle. An incredible miracle. Can you imagine? They were like soul sisters. That sharing had to just be incredible. And poor Zechariah, all he could do was listen. <laughs> when Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist, Zechariah's mouth was open. He believed. So it's kind of interesting. So when we're reading the scripture, it's like, it's like taking that, that, you know, it's kind of like when we don't believe and don't trust, it's like we become dumb. Zachariah, we can take the story. When he believed, he said, yes. Mary could speak. And she sang this great canticle that's prayed every day in the church by Anyway, laity, sister, priest, listen to this. She says, My being proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit finds joy in God my Savior. For he has looked upon his servant in her lowliness. In ages to come shall call me blessed. God who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Can we not all pray that prayer? Isn't that our experience with God? God has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. Now she moves beyond herself. Now watch what happens. She moves now to, to the poor. Mary now moves to the poor. She says this. He has shown might with his arm. He has confused the proud in their inmost thoughts. He has deposed the mighty from their thrones, raised the lowly to high places. The hungry, he's given every good thing, while the rich, he sent empty away. He has upheld Israel in his servant, ever mindful of his mercy. Even as he promised our fathers, he promised Abraham and his descendants forever. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? Mary just gives immense gratitude and then says, God favors the Lord. He casts out the light. Isn't that like wisdom that I know the Bible studies are doing wisdom? Yes. And there's something similar to that in the book of wisdom. Right. Oh, yes, the book of wisdom is filled with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Mary is the fulfillment, and Jesus is the fulfillment. So what I would like you to do now, before we take a break, I'm going to give you a packet. I get to each take one. You can keep it if you want, and if you don't want it, you just give it back to me. I feel like you're hurting. Last feeling was hurt years ago. Thank you. 
affliction. So you can see that. Mary as an older woman. Tradition has it that Mary died, they believe, maybe between about 11 and 13 years after Jesus died. So back then, she would have been an old woman. Not today. <laughs> oh yeah, so we have the resurrection, a resurrection scene. So just um once you have found your favorite one, I would like at your table to share why. Why why does that picture speak to you?
brings me the fact that it's usually not sweet enough, or it's not soft enough. Wow. Okay. Okay.
stay away from that boy. There's no headache. Aside from having some dry stuff, there's like no headache, no body pain, nothing. We just went on with our day like We did it the next night. Sure enough, we had no headache. Father 
Now, Joseph, he's pretty quiet in the scriptures. You know, we know the angel came, reassured him, or in the dream, reassured him that he could take Mary as his wife. Because she is a good woman. Not to be afraid. So, he does take her as his wife. Okay. But, you know, look, as soon as Jesus is born, you know, Herod is out to kill all the babies under the age of two, two and under, in order to get rid of Jesus. So all these poor, now can you imagine being a mother, knowing that all these mothers are suffering the death of their two-year-old and under, they're being massacred. So Mary, can you imagine the grief in her heart? Meanwhile, again, an angel appears and said, you gotta get out of Dodge. So, Get out of here. And so they go to Egypt. Look, now Mary's in Egypt. Joseph, Jesus, new language, new culture, they know no one. Now, can you imagine? Newborn, running for your life, kids being massacred because of your son. Now you're in a foreign land. And it's not a text. <laughs> We're not getting back to people saying, hey, we, we got there safely. Because they have relatives. Mary and Joseph have relatives. No communication. Okay, so Joseph, Mary, these are the, such faith filled people. Now, then they come back. Jesus grows up in Nazareth. We don't know a whole lot. It's the hidden life. It's just kind of like he worked with his band. Out in the shop together. Mary and Joseph taught their son. That's why, again, Mary is revered in the Catholic Church. is because she did the formation of this human being. Remember, it's human. Jesus as a 12-year-old didn't go around, hey, I'm the son of God. <laughs> Guys, you know, we're in the synagogue. I know all the answers to this test. Na, 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 na. <laughs> I have my knowledge. No, 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 no. He, he, had to, he had to learn the scriptures and everything in the synagogue. He went to the temple and he did everything a 12-year-old did. With no, you know, halo. <laughs> I believe, and I believe scripture supports it, Mary in her heart knew. Because remember, the angel came to her and said, you will conceive and bear a son and name him Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. You're going to conceive the son of God. She knew that. I don't believe she sat him down when he was 15 and said, you know what, I've got to tell you something. <laughs> Surprise. I think, I think he realized it at the baptism. His baptism in the Jordan River. John the Baptist, Jesus said, baptize me. And then he heard, you are my beloved son, on whom my favor rests. Echoes the words to Mary. Blessed are you, on whom my favor rests, a parallels. So, the rosary then, the rosary is a journey through the life of Mary and Jesus. We're walking with the two of them. We can't separate them. I mean, we can, but we can't. You know, they're the sides of two the side two sides of a coin. So I'd like to give I want to give you this handout. That's good. Just take um, there's two sheets. There's two sheets there. Just top and bottom. And I'll take the extras because we have three over here. Yeah, two 
two sheets. And the date there at the top, 2017, I felt alive and we're not changing. I really didn't think this was 2017 on November 3rd. So the rosary then, St. Dominic had a vision of Mary in twelve fourteen in the, the Middle Ages and she taught him the rosary. That's when it came into the church. So the rosary doesn't date back to the third century. It's twelve twelve fourteen. Everybody has a paper? Then the church, the church, Pope Pius V established the rosary as a devotion in 1569. So, you know, we always have to, you know, the church is 2,000 years old. Things didn't happen the day after Jesus died. I mean, things really evolved. I mean, there's the heresies saying Jesus was just a superman. He's not divine. Okay? Jesus was, is, an historical person who is also the Son of God. So then it goes on to talk about the rosary. Um, the, the word rosary just means a, a crown of roses. So the rosary is the story of our salvation. It's a story. The rosary then, when praying, it's a meditation on the life of Mary and Jesus. It's a meditation. It's a way of meditating. You mentioned the mantra. What's your first name? Isaac. Isaac. Isaac mentioned that he does a mantra. Well, the Hail Mary and the rosary is a mantra. It's like the background music to the meditation. So it's not, necess it's not necessarily focusing on the Hail Mary. We can. we can. We can pray very intentionally each Hail Mary. Sometimes I can get, uh, you can get fatigued doing that. But the Hail Mary is like a mantra. Background music to the mysteries. So Mary's prayer, the Magnificat, I read that earlier. Jesus' prayer. What is Jesus' prayer? What prayer? Yeah, the Our Father. That's what Jesus taught us. That's how he prayed. So we're praying. When we pray the Our Father, we are praying the prayer that Jesus prayed to his Father in Arabic. Versus it's nuanced. It's translated in English, so it's not exact. But the concepts are all the same. So let's look at the mysteries of the rosary. We have the joyful mysteries on Monday and Saturday. Again, according to the church, if you really want to be hoyle, we pray the joyful mysteries on Monday and Saturday. So it's the Annunciation, Visitation, Birth of Jesus, Presenting Jesus in the Temple. That's what Mary was told. Your heart's going to be pierced. And then finding Jesus in the temple, it's when Jesus got lost. They were in the caravan. And so the anxiety of losing a child. Luminous mysteries. This is all about Jesus. It's the baptism of Jesus. But you have to remember, just because it wasn't recorded in Scripture, Mary was probably there. I mean, they were the people. You know? They moved together. Community was very, very strong. Not like here in America. I mean, community was everything. The wedding feast at Cana, Mary was there. Then she went up to Jesus quietly and said, uh, they're running out of wine. This couple's going to be totally embarrassed. Weddings were four days long, five days long. The community came from far, far away. And they hung around, 
Water was not safe to drink like in Rome today, and you drank wine. They were running out. Totally embarrassing for the couple. Mary, sensitive, goes to her son. Actually, she ushers him into his ministry. Because that is his first miracle. All she does is say, culturally, this is bad. Jesus, she moves him into his ministry. The transfiguration of Jesus up on the mountain with uh, James, John, Peter, and Jesus is transfigured. They see, they don't know this, but it's like a prefiguration to the resurrection. Okay? But they're not getting it. They're like, hey, this is great. We love it up here. Let's go three times. This is super. We're going to go back down there. And then the institution of the Eucharist, the last summer. Sorrowful mysteries. Glorious mysteries. Next page. Just read out the Apostles' Creed. It's like, in a nutshell, it's the belief system in the Catholic Church. The Hail Mary, the first part of it, is lifted by Holy Scripture. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Was added back when the rosary became, uh, when it was uh, by Pope Pius V. That second part is like, pray for us sinners. If you want to know more about the rosary, how to pray, so on, uh, the usccb.org, that's the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And then uh, the Gregorian.org has some really marvelous meditations on each one of them. So if one of the mysteries you're like, oh, what is the coordination of Mary? Go there, read up on it. Okay? So I gave you two resources so that you can further um, delve into uh, the rosary. So how about if we give everyone a rosary now? Sure. And then we're going to talk about women in the church. Because Mary, Mary is the model. Isn't that great for some reason? Yes. So I ask for 
an increase. And then pray that Hail Mary for an increase in faith, increase in hope, Hail Mary, increase in love, Hail Mary. And then this be is the glory be. In glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it will be forever. Amen. Then we start when the mystery, each mystery of the rosary begins with an Our Father. And then the ten heal movies. Second mystery, our Father, ten heal movies, and so on. Fifteen, twenty minutes to pray the rosary. How fast do you pray? How fast do you pray? I can't get it that fast. <laughs>
Oh gosh. In Cary. Cary, yes. Ohio. Oh yes, it's wonderful. It, it's wonderful. And um, if you go down into the basement of that basilica, which you can go there easily, when you go in, go underneath, and um, you see crutches, masks, you see all sorts of things that are of inhuman that occurred there at the basilica through the prayers here. You can literally see the crutches and stuff on your mind. It's amazing. It is an amazing place. So, it's a very powerful prayer. So what I'd like you to do now is to come over here and sit in the chairs. Like in the Catholic tradition, we may pray to a saint, right? Mm -hmm. And we ask that saint to intercede. We ask that saint to pray for us. Okay. So we can ask Mary to pray for us. Okay. Just like any saint. For those of you who have lost a close loved one, do you pray to that loved one? Communion of saints. I think you're going to hear that coming up soon. We can pray to those who have died. So a parent. Another close loved one, a sibling, you can pray to them. Because see, in the Catholic tradition, it's we are all one. We're not there. They died, and they're like up there, and they have nothing to do with us. And we're, we're just on our own down here, and we're praying that we get up there. No, the church says, no, we're all right here. Communion of saints. Jesus says, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there, God is here, Jesus is here, Mary is here, the communion of saints. There's just a thin veil between us and the other side. This is a thin veil. We're one. At Mass, we hear the word of God. It has a power to touch our hearts. We become one. We're, we're intimate. Then we move to the Eucharist. We become one. Actually, the Eucharist, the whole Mass, it's a marriage of heaven and earth. It's the union of heaven and earth. It's where it becomes one. We receive Jesus. We're, we're one. We're one. So yes, we can pray to the saints. We can pray to Mary, Joseph. Good question. Hey, anything else? I don't know where we're getting the water. Is it not projected? It's not doing anything. I'm going to turn the TV off. I may have turned that off because I did touch this. But so I've been turning it on and off. Oh, did it okay. Pop? Did, did it just start? Well, let's talk about women in the Catholic Church. What's your burning question? What's the burning question? Any burning questions? 
before I kick off. None? Yeah, 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 somebody got a healthy. No, he was talking oh, about my socks. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he had some socks on you. <laughs> I know that there are four women who are considered doctors of the church. Yeah. And I had the day, you know, I really wish you would explain the four doctors. Oh, the doctors of the church. Great. So the women in the Catholic Church, we have four women who the church has raised up as doctors. Now, doctors mean is that they are recognized to be deeply spiritual and have passed on a way to live life, a, a, a spirituality. Verse 1, Saint Therese of Lisieux died at the age of 24, named a doctor of the church. 24. She was cloistered. Cloistered means she lived in an enclosed life, means that she wasn't out teaching or taking care of orphans or feeding the sick. What did she pass on to us? It's called her little way. And you know what that was? She did every little thing with love. The church recognized her as being just outstanding in that. And when you read her life, although some of the translations are so soupy, it's like, oh, geez. You know, it hardly makes her human. It's yeah. like, geez. Um, because she lived a difficult life in the cloister. Okay? Another is uh, Teresa uh, of Avila. She wrote on the stages of prayer. She was a mystic. And she reformed the Carmelite women's congregation. She did a huge amount. And you can read her books. This was in the 1500s. The Interior Castle is one of her uh, on prayer, which is really excellent. She talks about the stages of prayer, the Interior Castle. The Way of Perfection, really a nice book. So those books have, they're timeless. You can still go on Amazon.com and get the interior castle. Okay, the language has been updated, of course, but the content is the same. Catherine of Siena, great woman. She went to the Pope. She was a. She had the audacity because the Pope left Rome and went to live in France because he got scared in Rome. Stuff was going on. All kinds of stuff historically, and um, so he left. She's there in France, and she's like, you need to get back to Rome. Kind of like you wimp. <laughs> so she goes to the Pope and said, you know, you need to be leading the church. So these women in the church, they were strong women like Mary. Um, so women right now in the Catholic Church, the Pope, the popes, have not allowed the or have not allowed women in the Catholic Church to be ordained. Okay, why is that? It's it's a very simple answer, but it might leave your head. You might scratch your head. It's because of the doctrine of apostolic succession, which means this: that. All the bishops and priests, the popes, bishops, and priests, from the time of Jesus, begin, beginning with St. Peter, have succeeded down. So, you know, this pope took, Peter dies, and another pope takes his place. These popes um, name bishops, the bishops ordain priests. They're in the apostolic line of Jesus and Peter. See what I mean? And they have all been men. Now, for the Pope to say, 
now women, it, it is going to create, he, he can't just do that overnight. Because we have a 2,000 year old institution that moves very, very slowly because it's worldwide. Now, the Pope is, though, asked for a group to study women in the Catholic Church to become deacons or deaconesses and serve that way in the church. Now, in the early church, there were women who were deacons. It has, it has some tradition, and then for some reason, probably the oppression of women over the years. I mean, it, it fell out. Because, you know, going back, maybe sometimes today too, but going back, women didn't have a voice. I mean, they didn't have a voice at all. Even, you know, like back in Jesus' time, you know, when it says, or the prophets, about taking care of the widows and the children, the reason why there was so much emphasis on taking care of the widows is because without a husband, they had no rights. They had no way to earn money. They were done. They were as good as dead without a husband. So that's why Jesus and that always said, take care of the widows, take care of them. Because they are now the poor. So women, you know, oh, I mean, years have just never been able. So, you know, now, 21st century, do I think I'm gonna see women as priests in my lifetime? No. If we do, I'm gonna be like totally shocked. Totally shocked. Wow. Deacons? Ah, maybe if I lived till 90. Yeah, we could see deacons. So, well, women can't be ordained and do mass and the sacraments. Okay, but on the other hand, what women have done in the church has been more, has like freed them up to do things that the men didn't do, such as this whole country, the health system, hospitals, who built those in the beginning? Yeah, the, the sisters that came over from Europe, the women. Who built the school system up, Catholic school system up? The sisters, the women. So now let's, let's just play this out, just to, just to poke at it. Had they been ordained, would they have been able to do that? Probably not. See, God, God will, God is working things out. God's, God works things out. Because I think as women, I think, would I want to be ordained? No, I know this either. Because I, right now I'm freer not being ordained to serve God's people. I mean, we need the priests. And I love working with Father Herb and supporting him and so on and so forth. Would I like to be able to do the anointing of the sick when I go on hospital visits and so on? Yeah, you know. Or, you know, I work a lot with people, a lot with people one-on-one, -on -one, counseling, spiritual direction. Would it be nice, you know, after someone like tells me everything? to offer the sacrament of reconciliation? Yeah. That might be helpful to some rather than going to a man. Some women might find relating to another woman easier. But you know what? It can't be. Yeah. So let's take a look at women in the church and what are some of these like amazing women that are not yet saints. They're not saints. They're lay people. Okay. Come on now. Okay, who's the tech guru that can just move it to the next slide? Right okay, I'm going to have you move it to the next slide. Here, I'll... Uh, do you want to make that full screen? Yes, please. Yeah. So then we'll 
values. Women in the church today, what are they doing? So I just went back a little bit. How many of you are familiar with Dorothy Day? Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Dorothy Day? Yeah, Dorothy Day. What a great woman. There she is. It's just my, what, what do I need to put? Just, just click one, uh, as you want to just put this button right here. So it's okay. Okay, got it. Dorothy Day, a journalist, a social activist, and a convert to the Catholic Church. Incredible lady. John Paul II called her a servant of God in the year 2000 and opened her cause to sainthood. What did she do? She was in New York during the time, during the time of great need. Cited an example quoted from her saying, the, this is what she said, the journey towards faith in such a secularized environment was particularly difficult, but grace acts nonetheless. So she's honored for her heroism in the faith. Lay person who struggled a lot, came here, started the Catholic worker movement, started to meet the needs of the poor. In short, she had a rugged life. She had quite a number of men in her life, got pregnant. One of the men said, you will get an abortion. Well, she got an abortion. She got an abortion. She met another man, Catholic. She converts to Catholicism. Her way was rugged. It was rugged. Her cause is up for sainthood. Because what she did with her life, even though she made her share of, of mistakes, but see, nothing is lost on God. Nothing's lost on God, so he takes it. Okay, all right, so you made that choice. Whew. Not very good, but you know, I'm going to work with it. Nothing's lost on God. Even the church looks at her and says, really human. She suffered a lot. Benedict, 2013. Dorothy Day is an example of conversion. She turned her life around. What a model. You can, there is a film about her called The Long Loneliness. The Long Loneliness. Check that film out. It's just amazing about this woman. So, you know, when we think of the church, you know, the church isn't looking for saints to be like these perfect non-human people. I mean, look at St. Ignatius of Loyola. You know, he started the Jesuits. Oh my gosh, he was, he was quite the character. He was a, a knight, you know, in shining armor, and he was, you know, all, you know, bravado and you know, womanizer, and he, vanity, you know, and then in war, that cannonball smashes his leg, ends up in bed, mad because he doesn't have what he used to have, and then his leg wasn't growing together right, so he told the doctor, break it again, because I want to look good in my tights. <laughs> they did. They reset his, no anesthetic. Busted his leg again, reset it so he could look good in his tights. Yeah, right? I mean, it's like, really, he was that vain? But that was the orientation of his life until his sister gave him a book on the lives of the saints. And he started reading. Working through the written word and 
his life begins to shift incrementally, and he is now known as the soldier for Christ. Great man. Oh my gosh, she gave us the rules of discernment, so on and so forth, how to discern God's will. He's a guru. And he was an excellent writer. He understood back in the Middle Ages the psychology of the human person. And it's all over in his writings along with the spiritual. You know, amazing people. Here's another one, Edith Stein. She became his sister, but she, she was Jewish. And because she was Jewish and she was in the convent, they hid her. They hid all the women who happened to be Jewish, converted to Catholicism during the Nazi regime. But unfortunately, they did catch up with her. And she was asked in one of the chambers. Jean Donovan, whoops, she. Ah, Jean Donovan. I pulled her out because she is a lay missionary who went to El Salvador. Parents did not want her to go there, but she just felt compelled to serve the people in El Salvador. So she went with two. Um, women who were sisters. She was a young woman and unfortunately in the end they were all raped and killed. All three of them. And then she tracked a woman a, really you know what she did July 9th, where she worked as a lay missionary in La Libertad, along with Dorothy Kazel and Ursula Nunn. The pair worked in the parish of the Church of the Immaculate Conception in La Libertad, providing help to refugees of the Salvadorian Civil War and the poor. They provided shelter, food, transportation, and medical care, and they buried the bodies of the dead left behind by the death squads. I mean, really? At the age of 23, is that what you would do? men or women, something, something in her. You know, the force of God that would do this at a great risk to her life, her future. So there are many, many ways that women today, I think, and men who embody the faith of Mary, the hope of Mary, the love of Mary, despite God-awful situations, and was not Mary in God-awful situations. And sometimes we can find ourselves in God-awful situations, or circumstances, or maybe Maybe it might not be us, but it might be a friend or a relative that we're standing with. So, the, so to conclude, the church's devotion, do you, you see why the church, why the Catholic Church honors Mary? That's why we honor her, it's because she gives us hope. She's a model. Right along with Jesus, it's kind of like we have a masculine model in Jesus, if you will, and we have this feminine model in Mary, and we need both. We need both the male and the female to balance us, so that, and then to ponder it and to meditate upon uh, Mary and Jesus. Why do we do that? So that we become like them, that we are transformed from our 
that, that we allow situations in life to transform us, that we respond as Mary, as Jesus, especially in harsh realities. That we learn how to stand with people who are suffering. I think that's what Jean Donovan did. She went over there to El Salvador and she stood with people who were suffering. And she experienced what they experienced. She stood with them. So sometimes it's not so much doing, sometimes it's standing with. Mary models it, and Jesus models it. So, may God be praised for a God has given us in Jesus, his son, who we're going to celebrate at Christmas, the whole incarnation. I mean, you know when I think about that? It's like God emptied himself and became human. Who would want to do that? <laughs> Who wants to do that? But yet there's a lot of joys being human though too, right? And so who wouldn't want to do that? But you know, it's that Jesus, so we have in Jesus someone who knows exactly what it's like to be human and knows temptation. He didn't sin though. He didn't he didn't cross the, he didn't he didn't cross the border, so to speak. But he knows what it's like though to want to cross it. And Mary too. Mary, the church that she is sinless. So there are times when she wanted to cross the border too, but she didn't. So they call it the virgin. The virgin birth is because she did not conceive Jesus through the natural means. Okay. So that she remained a virgin. And you had asked if there were some questions. Yes, yes. Yeah. things that I, I could think of. Um, one is uh, Protestants do not teach that Mary remained a virgin. Mm -hmm. Oh well, yeah, where, where did we get that? Where, why does the church believe that? The church believes that she was a virgin because uh, tradition, tradition, and this and the scripture. Uh, let me let me think how to explain that. Um, the church believes that Mary remained a virgin because she was a woman who gave birth to God. So it's tradition. We're not going to find it in scripture. So it's probably where, you know, we're looking at, the Catholic Church is looking at Mary as this woman who is sinless and that she remained a virgin. So did she remain a virgin? You know, I want to say, you know, who in the world knows? Does that mean that Joseph and she never had any relations during their entire marriage? Now, I'm a sister, but I think that'd be pretty impossible. <laughs> I mean, On you know, the other hand, human nature is human nature. God's your first husband? I don't know. <laughs> I want to try to measure up that. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, um, the, the church believes that and teaches that because of the role she had in giving birth to the church, Jesus. And, Good question. And there was a tradition, I believe, also in Judaism of being a consecrated virgin. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that she was totally dedicated to saying, God. I'm dedicating myself. So in fact, there are consecrated virgins today. You can, um, uh, in fact, um, yeah, no, I know someone. She's probably around my age, a little bit younger, and uh, lived a single life and uh, very prayerful. Um, never married, doesn't, not seeking to marry, um, not wanting to, doesn't feel called to the religious life, living in community, so on and so forth. Um, so the, she went to the bishop and through a series of instructions and so on, she is a consecrated virgin, going about working like you and I. You would never know it unless she told you. And you kind of like knew her lifestyle. Um, so yeah, there are consecrated virgins. So, so my, as a woman religious, I am 
it's a consecration to God. Okay, at final vows, it's a consecration to God for the, for the rest of my life. So I promised, for the rest of my life, I promised chastity, poverty, and obedience. So chastity, basically, I am not married, but also chase means that I'm not getting attached to a lot of material things, okay? That I'm being reserved for God. Poverty, I don't have a bank account. I haven't seen a paycheck my entire religious life. It all goes to the Sisters of Notre Dame. The check is written out, Sisters of Notre Dame, not Sister Ann Mary. I don't exist in the corporate world, in, you know, banking world goes to the sisters. Now, how do I live? How do I, you know, have a shirt to wear? It's because we are given then, each sister has a stipend for the year in which we buy our clothes, coats, whatever, boots, whatever, uh, for going out to eat, uh, books, mm, gosh, anything that I might like, uh, anything that I might eat, Gosh, it would be everything, eating out, everything. So we get $2,500 for the year. That's our limit. You make it work. That's my vow of poverty. So, you know, I'm not eating at Biagi's, am I? <laughs> okay? I'm not going out to eat. I'm not, I'm not necessarily parishioners or doing different things. The women, uh, hey, you know, why don't you come along with us? You know, the ticket is $20. Am I going? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Okay, so I keep a simple life. It is probably good because then I'm not running about because I don't have the money to run about and it keeps me, it keeps me focused and it keeps me my time then to spend more in prayer and reading. Okay, and I'm not running around. So actually it's a good thing. Obedience is, obedience basically, gosh my whole life I live in obedience. The community asked me to teach. Did I want to become a teacher? Are you kidding? <laughs> I was a trained uh, social worker. But I joined the community. They said, we need a teacher. We're going to send you to Bowling Green. You get your teacher certificate, and boom, you know you're teaching junior high. Wow. I would do that. Whoa, OK. <laughs> Buck up, girlfriend. OK, so. So did that, and then, you know, I'm teaching, I'm at Central Catholic, I'm loving it at Central Catholic, I love the high school scene, da 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 I'm in my fifth year, I'm now director of the department for counseling and guidance, community. I get a call, Sister Ann Mary, we have a change in leadership, as you know, and we would like you to be the assistant to the provincial superior. says, you know, Ann Mary, we have this position, you think you're the best candidate for it. We'd like you to resign at St. John 23rd and assume whatever. Could they do that? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would probably break down into massive tears. <laughs> Who, me? Why me? <laughs> okay. But then you take on the spirit of Mary. You're obedient even when you don't understand so in, in that religious vocation, is there ever a retirement, or does it just go on and, and as long as you can? Yeah, that's a great question. We do have sisters who are retired who live in White House. There where Leal Catholic School is. We have a retirement center out there on Davis Road. 
Um, so yeah, once, once the body, we retire when we can no longer keep the pace. So there isn't an age like you're going to retire at 70. I mean, if you can still keep a good pace at 70 and, and earn a full-time paycheck, we do it. And the little, I've been around nuns and sisters, their pace is a pace. <laughs> <laughs> they are busy people, very busy people. Yeah. Yeah, so it's about always serving God. It's not about, you know, I don't think about a page. Because the community, I live with three other sisters. So the community provides the housing. We have to set a budget for the house and live within it. The budget gets approved. So, you know, we can get our food and, you know, laundry detergent, you know. So what the house, what the house needs. But, um, so the community absorbs that. So it's not like we're... I'm paying rent, or I'm paying, you know. What about your transportation? Transportation, the community provides the car. But I'm told what to drive, <laughs> when to take it in for an oil change. <laughs> and health care is through personal? Health care is through, uh, my health care is through ProMedica because that's the insurance of the diocese. Right, so my health care is through that, so my health care costs, meds, community picks that up. I don't need to pay for that out of the 2500 Yeah. Okay. So When you say community, you mean diocese, right? No, right. I mean Sisters of Notre Dame. Okay. I'm a Sister of Notre Dame. So I'm cared for by the Sisters of Notre Dame. Okay. So it's not like a, like bottom market is from the diocese. Right. Okay. He, and I live in community. The diocesan priests do not live in community. The Jesuits, St. John's, St. Francis, the Oblates, those guys live in community. Okay. And they live the same lifestyle I live. Okay? Where the diocesan priests don't need to take a vow of poverty. They need to be obedient to the bishop. They're chaste. Okay? I did not know the difference. Yeah, yeah, that's the difference. Okay. Yeah, so I live I live in community. Community takes care of me. I my paycheck goes in. So it pays for me. You know, my year, it, it pays for me, and maybe, maybe another sister who's in good health. You, you know, but we still don't have enough money to pay for everybody in retirement because there's not enough of younger ones. And the sisters are also paying for the education, like when you went to BGSU. But yes, the sisters paid so, for my, I have two master yeah. degrees, and so they pay, they pay for all my education. Yeah, yeah. So we're 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 taken care of. Uh -huh. I have a question. Um, this education is new to me, so I apologize. I'm trying to. That's okay. Ask a question to where it's like my mind's wandering. And um, so I understand you guys are devoted. You're not married. You do not have children. Do you come across ladies later on life to where they have been married, divorced, and/or children from previous situations? Uh -huh. Do you have women that do come in mm -hmm. sisterhood and nuns that have already loved, you know, mm -hmm. was living that life before? And yeah. Okay. Every now and then. Because if, if a, the woman needs to be free of responsibility with raising children, so the children need to be, you know, okay. out of the nest. In other words, they don't have little ones. No, no, no. Okay. They can't come because that's their first. That's exactly. their first. Sure. Right. Right. But yes, we, um, yeah, uh, divorced. Uh -huh, married, divorced, and uh, then come later in life and uh, believe that God is calling them to religious life. We move slowly with it because that is a big shift. Right. Yeah. That That's what I'm shift. wondering if it happens because it's a big uh, it, it does, but yeah. it's, we go slowly with that. Because we actually had a woman, um, maybe, and how long ago was Adela? But that was before you. It was before you. Before Mark here. McDonough. So maybe about mm -hmm. seven years ago, eight years ago, a woman came through RCIA mm -hmm. uh, who had been married and divorced. Uh, she grew up in uh, Europe, in Romania, and she was um, an Orthodox Christian, but she converted. Uh -huh. And she actually uh, joined the Adrian Sisters mm -hmm. in Michigan and went through her second set of vows, but not the final. Oh, not the final vows, vows. okay. Felt that um, 
God was leading her in a different direction. Mm -hmm. But she had been married and divorced and all of that. Seeker. Okay. Well, it's been wonderful to be with you. Uh, I wish you all the best on your journey. And uh, let's, um, let's just be there with Jesus and Mary. And uh, all shall be well. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, right. everybody, for coming also. So. Oh. You wanted me to share before we all depart? Yes, remember we were so, praying? For my friend Mike Crawford, um, also a boyfriend's friend, he was having horrible issues with his pancreas, looking at this long, horrible procedure, year-long recovery. Longer story short, they went down to Cincinnati to go over what was going to happen during the surgery and recovery and what we're going to do for you. Ran their tests as usual, and they come back just at all, like, we can't find anything wrong. Uh, he's been dealing with this issue for three years. It's just been progressively getting worse. They didn't believe their first set of tests, and they just kept going through the realm of medical, like, what? Like, um, we were scheduling your surgery, and now we have no idea. We can't find anything wrong. Um, so, wow. I'm not going to question it. Just say thank you. That's <laughs> right. Because <laughs> <No? laughs> I can't comprehend. Because I'm from the medical field. Okay. And I'm going, huh? This can't happen. What? Can't be. So I'll it keep you guys happen. all posted. Uh, so far, so good. And they're enjoying it. They're not questioning it. So I bet. We'll yeah. continue to pray for, you know, that he continues to stay healthy. <laughs> Those things happen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Quick housekeeping thing. How many of you are registered with the parish or you get newsletters and things from the parish already? Okay, if you don't, on the kiosk back there, um, there's a, you know, here, the Advent newsletter is out. And your pictures are all in it. Oh, oh my goodness. Goodness. All been introduced to the church, but not your bios, just a thing about this is our CIA. So you can pick one up back there, otherwise you'll be getting it in the mail. There weren't any sign in sheets for today, right? No. Okay. I'll, I'll fill those up. And um, next week, no RCIA. So no RCIA tomorrow, and none next Sunday because of Thanksgiving weekend. And then we're going to be hearing from Laura, who's going to talk about the saints. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So thank you for coming. Come back. Today. Thank oh, you yeah, for I'm coming. excited. Very excited Great. about it. A good it. segue. This yeah, is excellent. Yeah. Yeah. excellent. Yeah, that would naturally follow. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. I guess we are. Yes, yes. I'm ready. I'm ready. What's that? Whenever you are. Would you like a little break or like a No, I'll just take some water. Okay. I'll be good to go. Yeah, Vivian came in and she turned the heat off. Oh, bless her. Um,